at Graph Enthusiast to graphstuff.fm, a podcast all about graphs and graph-related technologies. I'm your host, Jennifer Reif, and I am joined today by fellow advocate, Jason Koo. Hello. And our guest today is another fellow advocate and knowledge graph guru, Leanne Chen. Leanne is a developer advocate at DiffBot, devoted to using knowledge graphs to improve LLM-based applications. Her work focuses on researching and experimenting with ways to improve the accuracy and explainability of these applications, especially for production-ready LLM-based systems. She also creates content on generative AI with knowledge graphs, often using Neo4j and DiffBot technologies. So welcome, Leanne. Hello, uh, I'm super, super happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's uh, It actually feels unreal for me because like literally last August, I was like strolling through, you know, the Neo4j blog, like every article and wow, like, and especially I've been watching like both uh, videos or like, you know, the podcast from Jennifer and also Jason Koo. It feels so unreal for me. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we are so, we are so glad to have you. I know uh, some of your content was uh, how I was introduced to you, um, and hearing your story about how uh, how knowledge graphs work with with other things, which we'll dive into here in just a, a little bit. But I kind of wanted to get a little bit of story and background on on uh, your your current gig uh, at DiffBot and hear about what DiffBot is and and what it does. Yeah, that that's a good question. So DiffBot, um, it it like the main takeaway of the technology is. It extracted and structured the entire web data into a structured database, and, and it uh, forms the largest knowledge graph on planet Earth. Yeah, I, I'm not going to use the world because we don't know about planet Mars. We're just going <laughs> to focus on planet Earth. So it literally has the largest knowledge graphs, which support uh, verified information. And we're also currently fine tuning our own LLM based on the the copy of internet uh which is a graph version of the internet that we, that we have wow yeah. so so it's kind of like a a graph builder for unstructured data then right wow perfect perfectly <laughs> summarized yeah yeah i love that please please highlight that and <laughs> put it into a preview exactly yeah okay yeah. cool um, what kinds of, of technologies do they uh, utilize or, or how do mm -hmm. they kind of share that with others? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the mechanisms of the technologies definitely are like complicated, but in a nut nutshell, um, it provides web scraping technology, which means you don't need to build your own web scraper with, you know, Python, Beautiful, Stoop, that type of stuff. You don't need to build that. You just use the bot, enter you, uh, your uh, website, and it will extract the entire web data into a structured for format. You can access it through CSV, Excel. And also, if you want to go into like a more graph oriented approach, you can also turn any web data, any unstructured text data into a knowledge graph. Nice. Yeah. So that's, that's really cool. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Wait, so, uh, I, yeah, so I got a question. So when it produces information into a knowledge graph, is it, uh, so I got to ask, is it readily importable to Neo4j or another graph database system? Yeah, exactly. That's a great question. So uh, it's like, I think there's some, like, actually Tomas actually built this kind of like a bridge between DiffBot's, uh, like a knowledge graph builder and Neo4j. So DiffBot, uh, the it's called a natural language API. It extracts the uh, all like text data into nodes and relationships, right? And then uh, Tomas, uh, like he uh, invented, uh, not invented, like he structured that DiffBot graph transformer, which is on LinkChain. And you can literally just use that tool to transform DiffBots and all that, you know, nodes and relationships data into Neo4j. Yeah, so nice. uh, I actually did like a lot of my videos are like using uh, DiffBot to uh, construct knowledge graphs, and then I primarily use Neo4j. Actually, not primarily, like Neo4j is my only go to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we're very glad to hear that, of course. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's yeah. really cool that they the two technologies seem to play nicely together, at least you yes. know pretty well with with Tomasha's you know kind of integration in between exactly. the two. So that's that's really neat. Um, what about knowledge graphs kind of drew you in or or kind of got you started? 
Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So actually, you know what, like last August was my first time knowing that knowledge and graph can be used simultaneously. You know, like knowledge graph, I, I never heard of the term, even if I think Google introduced the knowledge graph term early on in uh, like uh, 2012. But I just never like that was never a thing to me. Right. It wasn't and mainstream, I, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't. And like and actually it just um, I, I wasn't very aware of the graph world either. <clears throat> so. Last summer, I was trying to work on some type of a uh, network analytics stuff, just like a side project kind of thing. And initially, I just saw one kind of like YouTube video, like just constructing like, wow, you can turn, you know, like a, I, I think that project was based on like Games of Thrones. It just turned, you know, the relationships between people and constructed into a graph. And that got me really, really interested, like, wow, I've never thought that, you know, text data can be visualized. Because like you usually think of text data, it's just like boring and black and white, you know, text. And then I just, you know, just that, that just, uh, like that kind of visualization thing just go, wow, I really want to know more about this. So, and, and somehow, I don't know why, um, Google just, when I was searching all this network analytics thing, Google recommended me or it pointed me to Tomash articles. And it just went from there. So, <laughs> <laughs> and like, like uh, so Tomash, was, uh, Tomash is such a great writer that hmm. like after reading one article, you just want to read the next one. And it also, like he also, you know, combined with, you know, some code chunks along with the text, like <clears throat> which allows the readers to, you know, like, oh, I understand this paragraph and I can also do some hands on. Yeah. And especially like his articles, like is really like, explaining how you can do Neo4j and Neo4j was so straightforward to me. Like for me as a totally beginner, I know nothing about graph analytics, that type of stuff. And it proved out that I didn't need to. Like, it's so easy to use. Like you can, you know, there's like a whiteboard on a Neo4j aura where you can just draw a node and create relationship. I started from there, like literally doing some drawings <laughs> to learn about knowledge graph. That's really cool. And yeah, yeah. And, and then like, I know some people may feel a little bit like is, you know, is cypher query hard to learn that type of stuff. But, and that was actually also kind of like a challenge for me back then, but actually cypher query is pretty, it's pretty straightforward too. And right now, like a lot of time when I want to create a database, I go to ChatGPT, I enter my natural language thinking, and it just generate a very neat cipher query. And I just use that to create a database. So okay. ChatGPT or these LLMs just make, you know, creating database, uh, graph database even easier. Like you don't necessarily need to be an expert at Cypher Curry, uh, even though it would, it may be helpful. Yeah. And it's not like a super hard language. It's not like, you know, you have to learn uh, uh, Python or, or Java, such as Jennifer, you're an expert in Java. I know nothing about Java, but like Cypher Curry is not like that, especially right now with LMs. So yeah. <clears throat> I think the very user-friendly experience I have with Neo4j just got like my learning um, of knowledge graph and, you know, graph analytics, just very, very smooth. So yeah, it's just, just been great. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> is there a, a, would, is that how you would suggest people who are new to knowledge graphs getting started then, uh, kind of with the, the graph drawing, uh, builder through that, or what, what are your suggestions, I guess? Yeah, that's a good question. So to be honest, I think it also depends on like the, you know, the different type of people, but I would say like, at least from what I heard or from what I have seen is um, just go to the Neo4j blogs or, or even like Tamar's uh, Medium articles. Like they're mm -hmm. like very user beginner friendly. I user friendly, <laughs> user beginner, yeah. user friendly. 
So like if people like me, I I would say, I which which means uh, people who know a little bit about Python and no knowledge about knowledge graph, but interested in visualizing text data into knowledge graphs, yeah. <clears throat> then uh, I think Tomas articles could be the you know the, the go to and learn about knowledge graphs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Tomas is he's written so many articles, right? Um, yes. Is there like could do, could you pick out one that you would recommend to folks to be like, oh yes, this is a great <laughs> starting <laughs> article. I think I need to pull pull out my medium history, <laughs> uh, reading history. So I was just thinking, like you, you know, because yeah. there are so many articles, and you had mentioned right, like you had started yes. with one, you couldn't remember, but yes. it kind of set you off on this path. It, exactly. um, in a way, kind of reminds me of jumping into data in a knowledge graph, right? Like, there's really no definitive starting point, right? You just kind of start yes. someplace, and then you f start jumping from connection to connection, and then, you yes. know, you've got like a you know a summary of of Tomash's articles that you've read in your mind, but um, yeah. it's a graph. But, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a graph, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually right now like reading. I, I'm on the Medium website right now. I actually found this. <clears throat> I can later send this link. So there's one called Context Aware Knowledge Graph Chatbot mm -hmm. with GPT-4 and Neo4j. Okay. That is yeah, let me, yes. yes. But, and also another one, because I, I think I read it. <laughs> so uh, another one is creating a knowledge graph from video transcripts with ChatGPT. Nice, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I've seen that one too, yeah. Yes, let me just send through the, the stereo chat I have to find. Or or I just attach it in the document. Yeah, later. that sounds great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was was that? I think that article came up before the experimental knowledge graph builder came out. Probably. Uh, yes. Yes. So this is like they're super early. Um, he he wrote those two articles in April, like last year. Mm. But like I just dis I literally discovered those two articles in in August. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. No. Super insightful stuff. Um, okay. So like it kind of leads into like, what, uh, what are you working on now? What's, what's caught your interest at the moment? Well, so I think right now there's like a growing, growing interest in like how knowledge graphs can be brought into like retrieval augmented generation, like rack systems. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> but right now, like folks are still exploring like how. Like there's a, interest, a growing interest in graph rack, like that could be one approach. And then there's also some thoughts about like, it doesn't have to be either vector-based rag or graph rack. Like, could it be both? So actually currently me and uh, Tamash and, and I, we, we are working on um, vector plus graph rack project. Because uh, the, the the nice thing about Neo4j is it it actually it's not just a graph database. You can also store those like in embeddings like the, the vector stuff into nodes, right? Yeah. So yeah. what we're working on right now is we want to kind of leverage both sides because uh, the vector based rag is more semantically rich, like it can, you know, fetch more context. But knowledge graph is where information can be grounded like it's deterministic right so <clears throat> we want to leverage both like you know the flexible feature from vector based and also the more deterministic nature of knowledge graph leverage both together yeah, yeah. nice early the the, the project Tomaj and i are working on very cool is is, <laughs> is there like a little sneak peek you could tell us like um you know, like, so for someone, you know, other people trying to do this um, yep. sort of project, right, to marry vectors and graphs, yes. what, uh, do you have any, any suggestions for them or, or, or gotchas that they should avoid? Well, the only suggestion is we're going to release a video on that. So go watch that video. Oh, <laughs> no, nice, and, nice. And a article. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I mean, great. Well, well, we'll be looking for that then for sure. Oh, sure. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
Nice. Oh, uh, actually, speaking to this, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, we've talked on this podcast about, you know, using Langchain and some AI and LLM orchestration frameworks. And a lot of your videos recently has been talking about DSPY, which is oh. kind of a layer on top. <laughs> Could you, for those of our, you know, those of our audience who have never heard of DSPY, um, could you kind of intro and explain what it's what what it is and what it's good for? Sure, uh, I think I'll just speak from my experience because so, <clears throat> sorry, I just want to be clear that I'm not an expert on on DSPY. It's a modular framework, which means, you know, GPT four or a uh, Llama three, you have to have a prompt template, right? And you have to write it very, very detailed to instruct those LLM-based API. But DSPY is a modular framework where um, it has its own mechanism to improve, especially self-improve prompts for you. So you don't have to, you know, like tweak those manual prompts like what we did in uh, lane chain or function calling with uh, OpenAI's API. So that's that's the um, main idea behind DSPR. Just make it modular, so you don't have to, just to avoid that. You know the, the very tedious prompt designing thing. Uh, recently, my videos had like I've been testing out this technique, and what I have seen or experienced, and it just just comes from my personal opinion. Like I'm not gonna generalize. Everyone's experience is gonna be the same. But <clears throat> there's there's one thing that we cannot avoid is LLMs are unpredictable, and they are not like they don't necessarily have perfect reasoning ability yet. I use the word yet. <laughs> so LLMs are trained trained to dream according to you know like the. Uh, like some of the OpenAI employees, like they, they or the DAO leaders, they said they, they are trained to be creative. That's why we saw or we see hallucinations. Mm -hmm. Like hallucinations are not their fault. They're, they are trained to be like that. But, and the other is on, on predictability is even if we instruct them to do some things, for example, I want to, I want LMs not to hallucinate or I want LMs to stick to something, it doesn't necessarily follow. I don't know whether you guys also have that similar experience oh, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> right, right? So it's a common feeling, like a mutual feeling, like LMs sometimes they're just stubborn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if, if we combine those two, like one is, you know, they're they being creative and the other is that they're just not controllable, I would say to some degree unpredictable. Yeah. So how, you know, how can we make sure that, like, if we, you know, hands-free, let them automate prompts themselves would ensure accuracy or, you know, the, the, the certain degree of uh, con like, you, you can control, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's a problem where recently I've been experiencing and I, I just saw that, you know, the, the DSPI framework, it, like, it's really nice that you don't have to tweak prompts like very detailed mm -hmm. but sometimes for some tags uh, or, or some type of jobs it just went a little bit too far so let me give you one, one example is <clears throat> there's one question which is who were the other co-founders uh, who founded SpaceX with Elon Musk and the self-improved prompt became uh, who co-founded companies with Elon Musk Hmm. It just went too far. Like what I thought, what I was focused on is SpaceX, right? I want to know exactly SpaceX, but it just, you know, uh, removed SpaceX for some reason. And it's not relevant to my original query, but that's what the, um, you know, the automatic improving prompt feature is in the DSPY framework. Yeah, so so that is my experience, and I ha also want to validate, you know, some other people they're having better results and and better experience. For example, I saw pe people use DSPY to <clears throat> um, to uh, fine tune text to SQL. Mm -hmm. I, I saw that notebook. It looks like their accuracy, um, like, ha like they they reached some really nice accuracy 
So they could have, you know, like some really valid and nice results, but from my experience or like some comments that I saw from our videos, like it doesn't necessarily generate that magical effect for every single task. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I, I, I think, that's, I think, yeah, I think sure. that's kind of just when you introduce LLMs in general, right? <laughs> it's it's yeah. going to do really well at, at certain things and then it's just going to yeah. miss the mark on other things. And again, like you said, you know, there's no way to really control that or completely remove those errors or completely fix all those scenarios. Um, it's just okay. going to have some element of unpredictability. At, at various cases, right? A hundred percent. Jennifer, you're so good at summarizing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have you in our videos. <laughs> anytime, yeah. anytime. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, so that's a yes, right? Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'd love to. Thank, sure, sure. Yeah, so um, I, I just want, I think the main takeaway that I, from this experience is that there's, you know, like a very um, high interest in using LMs and all kinds of texts, like, right? The, the question of whether we should use LMs, it's not the right question. The right question or the more correct question should be to what degree should we bring LMs in which type of task? Yeah. Yeah. I think last year, that's a... a Fantastic observation, I think. Last year, I think all of us were kind of uh, in the, the typical technical person phase of, ooh, new shiny technology. Let's throw it at everything. Let's use it for everything. Um, and then as we kind of get more mature and we figure out, okay, it doesn't work so well for this. It works well for this. Then we're starting to get into this again. What degree should we be using this and where is it exactly useful? And I think that's kind of the phase we're either starting into or, or kind of digging into this year um, is where can we apply them where they're super useful and where other cases where they're still not useful yet, you know, and again, that exactly. may change as you, as you said, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And, and I, I think it's, you know, it's, uh, it's really nice to see people are trying things out and e even though it, initially the enthusiasm is like really high and as we try things out, we would, you know, have more data points that help us understand, oh, uh, this task, we should, we want LMs to be less creative. So we would probably need some more deterministic approach. Yeah. But if it's like writing blog posts or actually not because some, some blog posts like AI generated are just not good. Or I don't know, some, some drawings or, or something, some jobs that, or, or tags that just need more or enhanced creativity than LLMs can be good tools. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I know, like you know, the, the developer productivity kind of side of things too, is the hardest thing sometimes in creating content is kind of getting it started or knowing how to move from one piece to the next. And I think that might be an opportunity that LLMs could do well. They pop up ideas really well, or they yes. kind of just spit stuff out there. And then yes. you can kind of pick and choose. It's like, no, I didn't really want to go this path. Let's, you know, find something yeah. else. But sometimes they'll spit something out. It's like, oh yeah, this is the direction I want to take this. So I think it yeah. can, be, can be helpful there. What were you going to say, Jason? Um, I was gonna say, yes, just like, you know, if you're creating like narrative short stories, something that does require a lot of creativity, like LLMs are, are fantastic. Um, that, that, that statement you just made, Jen, kind of reminded me of, um, you know, like just recently, you know, uh, chat GPT 4.0 came out and they updated the mobile app. Have, have either of you played around with the, um, kind of the, the live speaking mechanism of the app now? Uh -uh, it I is, haven't. It's it's quite impressive. And um, yeah, I think it was just like over the weekend, I was just asking like, you know, what? hey, chat GBT, if I want to create a, you know, very interactive graph web application, what stack should I use? And ended up getting into like a 10 minute conversation with it and like, well, what if, you know, we replace that with this stack and, and it's also connected to um, the web application. Well, so it's all connected to your account, right? So uh -huh. as you're talking on the phone, it's also preparing like, code samples and if you ask it to create a file it becomes accessible on the desktop when you're going through a browser so you could go back to your history and you know download the files or take a look at the code and wow all that stuff it's yeah definitely um 
recommend trying that out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jennifer, you gonna say something? No, I, I was actually uh, gonna ask. Uh, you said you had used the mobile app. What's been your experience with that? Me or Jason? Yeah, yeah. Oh. You, Liam. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, like, to be really, really uh, frank, I, I think ChatGPT is a very good tool for therapy, that kind of stuff. Silence. <laughs> nice, nice, nicely yeah. worded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So actually, uh, I I think it's very good at providing validation. Like you know, like we, we are humans, right? And and we have feelings and we have emotions. And it had uh, it could like for me at least for me, it serves as a good not only just com companion. It's like it can validate your feelings or emotions. So what I think it's really important for me, like before chat GPT is <clears throat> um, like, I need to find ways like to sometimes to see, okay, how do I seek out some solutions? And right now this just becomes so accessible to me. I can chat it with any time, but I mean, if it's, you know, like very, um, if I need some like higher degree of higher level of stuff regarding, you know, and mental health support, like definitely experienced therapists, they're still needed. But I think ChatGPT right now to, to some degree, it has already like brought in some positive influence on me. And hmm. not just only me, like the, the, some of my friends, uh, they, they also share a similar experience too. Like they, they, um, it's not like we're going to replace it with real friends. No, it's not like that. But it's like a supporting source like yeah. to validate. Yeah, yeah like, really like, a, like a support agent or a problem solver. Uh, yeah. Kind of like um, we've been you know, talking about how AIs are good assistants, human assistants. And yeah. there's a variety yeah. of ways they can assist humans you know and help humans sometimes that's creative spaces sometimes that's just a little extra support or you know kind of yeah. you know uh backing uh that that kind of safety net you know to help you kind yeah. of work through yeah. something exactly yeah and and actually i want to uh kind of circle back to one of the points jason mentioned like like brainstorm with chat gpt i have to be very honest like a lot of my video ideas <laughs> come from chat gpt suggesting me oh cool oh. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Really. So actually, yeah, could you yeah. go into like detail or uh, more detail of like your kind of your video creation process? So you just mentioned, you know, like ChatGPT like um helps you, but I mean, you had to prompt the initial question, right? Like what is yeah, what is your workflow for for creating new new videos? Wow. That's uh I'll tr I'll try to streamline it for a little bit. So, I I think right now just like you know, there's a lot of things going on, like on, on LinkedIn, I mean, regarding Gen AI, LN research, the type of stuff, right? So there's a lot of interesting stuff. And if something caught my attention, actually, the initial thought I have is, where does, or where can knowledge graphs play a role in this? Is there any place that knowledge graphs can come in and, you know, improve the results and something like that? So that's an initial thought. And I would actually just give that question to ChatGPT and help me assess because it knows better about knowledge graph stuff than I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so it would, you know, help me assess if some of my hypotheses or assumptions are like closer to being realistic or not. Mm. And if, you know, and like I got approval from ChatGPT saying, oh, it's a good idea. I start experimenting. Okay, mm. cool. If not, if not, it's okay. I'll just share with the world too. <laughs> like telling, telling audience, oh, it doesn't work <laughs> or it does work. Yeah. You know? Oh, okay. So following up on that, like, so yeah. for anyone who's watched your videos, you, you, you can see that you're doing these videos over quite some time, right? There's a lot of, um, visually, there's a lot of jumping, but like, uh, intellectually and vocally it's all all cohesive so i'm curious like 
it, are, are you just, are you recording constantly as you're experimenting and then making snippets or, it, or are you just recording just when you have a thought? Yeah. Well, mm, it's actually a mix. Like I actually don't have like a standardized process to create content because, because content creation right now, I mean, at least for me is very back and forth. So initially I may have a thought on that and then spending some time alone or I was walking and some other thoughts just popped in and I was just, oh, that's a better idea. So I'm going to delete the previous. <laughs> so it's very back and forth and I actually need to do a lot of refilming, to be honest, to further insert that. Did I answer your question? Yeah, no. Yeah, you totally did. And, yeah. uh which, which just speaks to, you know, the amount of work that you're putting into this, right? Because, you know, video, you know, most, I think most videos that you watch on, you know, YouTube or on social tends to be like a single cut uh, or a single shot with multiple cuts. But yours is many, many shots with many cuts. And so it's, um, <laughs> it's very times. clear that you've, <laughs> but no, it's good. It, it clearly shows that you're like experimenting and like really going through this thing and that it, it doesn't give the illusion that, you know, implementing these sorts of, of technologies, like is super simple, super fast. Like, you know, it's like, oh, it's, you know, it's so easy. It's, you know, it's like all technology. It takes a bit of work and you can see it in, in your videos. Thank you. Thank you for validating that. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. So actually right now, like a single content piece of content, it would, even if it's just like seven to 11 ish minutes, it would take like 1.5 week to three three weeks yeah. okay mm -hmm. yeah i think there's an old adage something about uh, it, mainly for speech giving but like the shorter your your end content is the the, the more work kind of goes into it right versus going the other yeah. way yeah yeah so like i mean i could still be kind of like you know, like less experience compared to the, the, the other creators. I'm still kind of green in this, but I would say um, for if you really, really focus on quality, especially like you want to make people interest, you want to engage people, then there would be a lot of, lot of work that you need to put into it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think you have a lot of this, um, you know, when you, when you try to, good lesson for me, I think too, is, you know, I try to do everything perfect in a single cut, you know, try to mm. try to rehearse several times up front, try to make it, you know, one single shot, not have to do, you know, edits or tweaks. If you do try to be really careful that it's perfect and that it looks flawless. And I think that there's something to be said and, and something super valuable for introducing kind of this more conversational kind of here's what's going on at this time or here's you know this little snippet that I had here's how you do this and then you know come back at a later time and here let's it's it's more lifelike I think and it again yeah. as Jason said it shows kind of this longer process of I'm investing days or, or weeks as you said in this project mm -hmm. and here are the little snippets I've learned along this time frame. Um, so I think that's, that's really fascinating. It's really cool. It very efficiently and successfully gets your message across. It's just a different style than, than I think what many of us have seen. So. Yeah. Yeah. I really like every, every, uh, creator has a different style and, and I, I totally resonate with what you just said, uh, Jennifer, which is like, <clears throat> you know, we, we want to make, you know, that even, it's just like a two minute thing. You ha you want to make it perfect, right? <laughs> wow, that really goes to, you know, we really go to a lot of rehearsals, right? Yeah. But, but I think we, uh, at the end of the day, just for every creator, what we really want to achieve is like we provide values. Yeah. So no matter what the style is, as long as the viewer, after watching the content, they learn something. They like what they learn. Yeah. And that's the, the end goal for that. Yeah. Perfect. I think that's a fantastic <laughs> wrap up on that one. Um, maybe let's, let's kind of just uh, break there with our perfect little closing and we'll uh, kind of jump into tools of the month. If that's okay with you, Jason. Yeah, no, perfect. Okay. 
Great. Uh, I'll just go ahead and, and share mine and then uh, whoever wants to jump in next, feel free. Uh, so my tool of the month, uh, kind of a, kind of an odd one, I guess, maybe is is just the Cypher shell command line tool. Um, I've uh, worked on a presentation recently where um, I was kind of loading data in and needed to run queries and I run it all uh, this particular demo in Docker containers. Um, and so running via Cypher shell is just really easy to connect to the Docker container, do this remotely. I don't have to load up a browser or anything fancy like that. I can do everything through command line, which I, which I love. Um, so it can, it's built into a lot of the Neo4j installations. Um, but if you uh, want to use it separately, you can download the Cypher shell command line tool separately as well as its own bin, uh, and install it. Um, so I use it. I think kind of both different ways. I've used it pre-installed and stuff, and then I use it as a separate tool as well. So uh, feel free to check that out. There's some documentation on it um, too, and I'll link that all in the show notes. So shout out to uh, Cypher Shell. <laughs> nice. Uh, I guess uh, I'll go real quick since mine is probably less interesting than Leanne's. Uh, so recently I've been playing around with uh, Cytoscape JS. So it's it's an old library that's been around for quite some time, but um, Specifically, I've been playing around with a Streamlit component called ST Cytoscape. And what it allows you to do is put Cytoscape right into a Streamlit app. And it's quite um, uh, it's quite simple to use uh, compared to some other libraries. And its interactive callback works quite well. Um, it, it, Streamlit, so for those who have used Streamlit, it, it's basically um, kind of a sequential top-down processing um, application to turn a Python script into a web app. It doesn't have reactive components. So doing kind of sort of highly interactive stuff can be tricky sometimes, but uh, the ST Cytoscape component um, simplifies the process so that you can get, you know, like when a user's clicking on nodes and relationships and, and kind of switching its mode, you can, wow. you can react to that in, a fairly uh, intuitive manner. So that's oh. that is my tool of the month. That's very interesting because me and Tamar are actually <clears throat> building a stream of that. So we definitely need mm. that. Okay. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. okay, yeah. I I will hand my notes over to you guys because um I, yeah sure, I've, sure. I've been very looking a long time to find like a, a a graph visualization tool that lets you also like interface with the nodes and relationships so that you could yeah. do things to them, right? Um, so previously what I found is, uh, so Jason, I actually watched your video, like early on, you made a video on Streamlit with GraphViz, right? Which is a static, static. Uh, yeah, I think I did one with GraphViz and Agraph, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so Agraph is closer to what we saw, <clears throat> what we see in the UI in Neo4j, where your mm. nodes and relationship, but it doesn't have that interactive feature. Yes, right. Yeah, so, but oh, Cytoscape I, I, does. Okay. I'm so grateful that I came to today's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Nice. Hey, yeah, Liam, what's your what's your tool of uh, the month? Okay, so I'm not going to share a tool of a month. I'm going to share a tool of multiple months. <laughs> oh, <even> better. <laughs> so I've been using LangChain StiffBot Graph Transformer for at least the past four or five months. And it's a great tool because <clears throat> you just, you can turn any unstructured text data into a knowledge graph and load into Neo4j and further query that knowledge mm -hmm. graph. Yeah. So this is my mo uh, tool of the previous multiple months and gonna, gonna be like a, a tool for the following months. <laughs> <laughs> Long-term tool of the month. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's probably nice. a little off the topic, but yeah. No, that's cool. Well, yeah, I, I think anyone that's you know working with Langchain and, and wanting to do graphs and graph rag, it's, I think it's the Diffbot um, mm -hmm. mod transformer, and then so, mm -hmm. was it Langchain also made a graph transformer? Those are like the only two. Oh, it's a so it's it's uh the the same thing as a plugin like. LangChain just makes, you know, like you just have to pip install LangChain and everything just runs so smoothly, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's like in the back end, it's calling the DiffBot API. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Nice. That's why these are, yeah, it's a beginner plan friendly. Very cool. All right. Um, so 
with that, I think there's some some articles and videos out there. But the thing we want to kind of highlight this month is the call for proposals or call for speakers for Nodes 2024. Um, and, you know, we did uh, chat with Leanne just a little bit before the episode, um, and she plans to submit something to Nodes. So, hey, if you're interested in hearing more from Leanne, please come to Nodes and register. Um, but if you're also interested in uh, submitting something to speak. Uh, we would love to have uh, anyone's graph story or experiences or projects um, kind of featured in our virtual online conference. So I think just to kind of uh, do this segment a little bit. We just kind of want to talk about the CFP, maybe some ideas, tips for submitting, uh, putting an abstract together and get kind of Leanne's inputs, inputs as well from that. So does anyone want to kick it off or have thoughts? Um Sure. Okay, so where well, where do we go off from that? Uh, okay, so uh, I, I think the CFP is pretty straightforward for nodes. Um, and we have four different tracks, right? So we've got the AI track, you know, Gen AI. We've got uh, apps. We've got um, graph track, which is kind of like visualization, visual, visualization tips and tricks, and then uh, a data science track. So pretty much anything that. Um, that you've done or plan to do, you know, in the next couple months, that's graph related, there's, there's going to be a track that it fits into. And we take talks from very beginner level to quite advanced. So whether it's just, you know, showing off, you know, combinations of, of products to get effects, uh, DSPY, um, anything that that touches graphs uh, is, is, is going to be a good candidate for for a talk. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know, Leanne, if you've had a chance to think mm -hmm. about your CFP, but, um, mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. there, are, are, do you have like a short list of, of, of topics that you're kind of leaning towards? Yeah, I definitely have. And I'm having a hard time to choose what you submit. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a good problem yeah, to have. for me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I know. That definitely will be something that I just have to think. Cause, uh, as I mentioned previously, like right now, Tomas and, and I, are doing like a <clears throat> deathbot and neo 4 j type of collab of project so that and and especially tomas uh, tomas being putting so much work on on that yeah hmm. so i think that could be worth sharing too still yeah. thinking about that yeah. that would make a great session i think mm -hmm. yeah. oh maybe each of us give maybe one tip to someone who's thinking about submitting like CFP and um, so I'm thinking, you know, someone who has, doesn't have a lot of experience doing talks and they're kind of like, Oh, you know, how do I get started? Where do I go? Um, yep. And I can kick that off. Um, so I uh, kind of hark back to an old podcast that, um, that an old graph stuff podcast that was done with Will. Um, he had done an episode with, um, Oh, I forget the other advocate, but he had done a long episode on like tips and tricks for general, like, call to papers and like how to think about it yeah and even to this day it's i think a great resource they, they really went uh deep into like how you want to kind of structure how you want to kind of set up the talk and what type of topic to go into um so yeah we'll, we'll have to put a link to that that previous uh podcast but yeah, so that i would start with you know something like that uh, a resource mm -hmm. love aimed at kind of first time cfp um submitters yeah. For me, I would say, um, well, Leanne, I think mentioned a good tip earlier is, is maybe run some ideas by chat GPT too, you know, <laughs> um, just Literally to, what I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I stole your thunder. Um, but, uh, just brainstorm some ideas. I, I think for me, I always try to pick something that I either want to learn or that I'm super passionate about. Um, because I think that goes a long way. Your abstract doesn't need to be perfect if uh, program committee and audience members see that you're really interested in the subject and you want to learn and you want to share what you've learned and help others learn too. And then everything I think will will to some degree fall into place from that point. Mm -hmm. um, we have two blog posts out, um, one uh, on the Neo4j blog and one that I have submitted um, through my blog and a couple of other uh, third-party places um, talking about kind of tips and tricks for submitting node sessions or other conference sessions and putting together abstracts and, and things like that. But um, I would say, yeah, just for for me picking something mm -hmm. that that you enjoy and that you love or interested in i think is going to be a great place to start 
Uh, May? Yep, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, th I think Jason's and <clears throat> Jennifer's advice, like, like they are, um, you know, like, just let follow follow them listen to them because they they have more experience but what i think what i can provide a little bit of suggestion i guess is actually this is what i learned from um other you know, creators as well is you just share your experience in the ellen space because to be honest you, you don't need to be perfect because we are all learning together and we need more we need to learn or know more people's experience to learn together and figure out what the gen AI thing is going on, right? Because no one actually knows how these language models work, right? I guess. And so that's why we need more data. We need more data points. And this is like a collective effort from human beings, right? Yeah. So I know like I can resonate with some of the uh, uh, creators or people who want to share like, wow, uh, am I not perfect enough? Or I don't think I'm good enough. I'm, I don't, I'm not qualified to share. Well, actually, no. If you share something, you're sharing, definitely, that you're definitely sharing experience that some people, some other people don't have, and you, they can benefit from your experience. Mm. Yep. So sharing itself doesn't exist, you know, the question of am I good enough and I'm perfect enough because if even if you're just like a week ahead of someone else, you are helping that person or those people to learn a week of knowledge ahead of them. Yeah. I love that. I talk. love, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Great advice. I learned that from someone else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, still pass it on. That's fantastic. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Jen, should we, uh, Tell tell the folks uh, what uh, what events that uh, we're, we're we're jumping into this yes. next month. This yes, month. so I have a couple of things that are that are virtual that are not showing up on the events page just yet, uh, but I'll I'll follow up on that. But my my in person, so if you want to catch me live and and uh, it, in real life, um, I'll be at KCDC in Kansas City, Missouri, USA, at the end of June. Um, so if you're in the area, definitely hit me up or uh, catch me there at the conference. I'll have a session, but I'll also be hanging around and visiting with with developers as well. So I, I would love to catch you there. Jason, Leanne? Uh, so I'll be in San Francisco twice in June. So I'll be up for uh, a joint session with Weeb8 and Neo4j. We'll be doing a joint kind of hack night. Uh, so, in very, so I'm very, I'm looking forward to yours, uh, Leanne, yours and Tomas's content because that would be great if we could at least talk to it or if we have time mm -hmm. to integrate some of that. Uh, so doing that and then also doing a talk at San Francisco uh, Python meetup group. Uh, so that's mid June, um, and then at the end of June, uh, hopefully, I'll be seeing Leanne over at the uh, AI Engineering uh, World World's Fair. Yeah! Wow! 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 That is, that's so exciting. <laughs> yeah, uh, me and the DevBot team with uh, our CEO Mike Tan and uh, Jerome True will, will be at the AI Engineer World Fair. So super, super excited to to meet some of the Neo 4 j folks. It's like Jason will be in person. Yep. Would be awesome. Cool. Yeah, great. Yeah. I, I will link all the other content and events uh, and everything that's involved for this month. It will all be in the show notes. Uh, so thank you again so much, Leanne, for joining us. Uh, we thank really you. have uh, enjoyed getting to talk to you and hearing about your content and your process and, and kind of getting to chat in person, even though we've seen kind of your recorded videos and stuff already. So this was this was really nice. We hope to have another opportunity to do this in the future. <laughs> Sure, it's a as I mentioned, such a pleasure. Um, like I as I said, I've been watching videos from you guys <laughs> early on, so it, it feels so. It just feels so so nice to be able to be in the same virtual room with you guys. <laughs> yeah, hopefully yeah, and, we'll be in another session. Yeah. yeah, hopefully sometime soon in the actual like physical space together. Yeah. So <laughs> yes, I would love that. All right, great. Uh, well, we will uh, talk to uh, everyone in the next graphstuff.fm episode. So uh, enjoy your month. Happy coding. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.